Welcome back. Medical treatment for transgender children and youth has become a political and medical minefield in Canada and around the world. Danielle Hamamjan investigates why some see the treatments as life-saving, but others worry it's all going too fast and causing irreversible damage to some children, especially girls. For most of his young life, Kian Olszewski lived with a secret that grew increasingly unbearable. I think the worst part of it is, you know, before you tell anybody. Because you're building up all these fears and ideas that you don't even know are actually going to happen. So you torture yourself with it. Believing no one in the small town of Pembroke, Ontario would understand, not even his twin sister, that torture wasn't only psychological. Then he had like all these um, cuts on his arms and I asked him about it and he said he fell skateboarding and I believed him because I didn't have a reason not to. As far as Kean's parents knew, both their children were like every other kid in town. Best of friends. There was a bond They're instantly. Oh. I mean, Just, they spent yeah. the first two years together in their crib. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, we finally yeah. got to separate you guys at bedtime here, you know? But Kean's parents were in for a shock. They were raising Kirsten and Caitlin, twin girls. I remember in my dreams being a boy, like whenever I go to bed and I wake up and I'm in this dream, I'm a guy, like, because in my mind, like, I shouldn't even have those parts there. So there's a big disconnect between myself and, like, that part of my body. It started around age four. Kian says he was more drawn to the boys' toys. Unlike his sister, he refused to wear dresses and skirts. Inside, he says, there was something tormenting him. He gradually became convinced he was born in the wrong body. We get a call from uh, the school that uh, Kian is hurting himself. Cutting, cutting his arm. There was a bunch of mm -hmm. cuts on his, on his arm. Your reaction? You know, we're just, oh my God, what? Like, why is, the, what's you know, happening? what's happening? What could be that bad? And me, father, you know, uh, 13, 14 year old daughter, pregnant. But pregnancy could not have been further from the truth. Kian was suffering from gender dysphoria severe discomfort between his biological sex and the gender he identifies with. The next morning, he slipped a letter under his parents' bedroom door. I'm struggling and I'm having a really hard time and I can't take it anymore. The truth is I'm transgender, female to male. This means that I was born with a female body, but a male mind. I can't handle people not knowing the real me and treating me like a girl, even though I'm a boy. And it says, love your son. <laughs> Kian was basically suicidal. And the last thing we wanted, we would have done anything to make sure that he was going to be with us for a long, long, long time. My hair, I got it all chopped off. I think it was eight ponytails, and each one was 22 inches long. With his parents' support, 14-year-old Caitlin transitioned to Kian. Within six months, there was a new haircut, a new wardrobe, and a life-changing prescription from a children's gender clinic in Ottawa. Getting close to eight or seven uh, months on hormone blockers. Hormone or puberty blockers are used to delay puberty. Little is known about their long-term side effects, but advocates of the drug believe they spare gender dysphoric children the distress of physical and sexual development. It's become standard treatment in Canada, but here in the UK, their prescription is now so contentious, a court was asked to intervene, triggering a fierce debate about the treatment of children with gender dysphoria. These drugs seriously harm me in more ways than one, and they have harmed many more, particularly young girls and women. Like Kian, Kira Bell was born biologically female. Her transition to male was made possible at Tavistock in London, which runs the only gender identity clinic for children in the country. 
At age 16, after what she calls a series of superficial conversations, she was put on puberty blockers, then testosterone. By age 20, she had a man's beard, a man's voice, and a flat chest following a double mastectomy, also called top surgery. But the feeling of being a man never came. Kira says she realized her gender dysphoria wasn't the cause of her problems, but a symptom of a history of trauma that was never fully addressed. She says she was sexually abused as a child, felt abandoned by her parents, and struggled with her attraction to girls. She detransitioned back to female and took Tavistock to court. I'm delighted at the judgment of the court today. It was a judgment that will protect vulnerable people. I wish it had been made for me before I embarked on the devastating experiment of puberty blockers. In December 2020, the court said it is highly unlikely and doubtful that a child could understand the risks and weigh the long-term consequences of puberty blockers, they refer to as experimental. As a result, Tavistock stopped all referrals for puberty blockers to children under 16. Today, a major Swedish hospital, highly regarded for its gender care treatment, is no longer giving them to under 16s. Finland has also revised its guidelines, advocating instead for psychological treatment over drugs. In the US, where trans kids are caught in a culture war, at least 20 states are introducing bills making it more difficult for children to transition. But Canadian policies are among the most liberal in the world. Depending on the province, parental consent for blockers isn't always required. My first duty is do no harm. I'm talking about children and young people. Psychiatrist Dr. David Bell is the former president of the British Psychoanalytic Society. He also treated adults at Tavistock for nearly 25 years. In his capacity as a staff representative, he wrote a scathing report after colleagues came to him with concerns. They felt there was a rush to treat children without thorough assessment. And some of them felt that they'd been intimidated and threatened for raising concerns and were told basically to be quiet and were accused of being transphobic. A large number of these kids struggling with being gay or lesbian. And what was happening was that that wasn't engaged with and instead it became recast as uh, transgender. Dr. Bell is alarmed by the exponential rise in children being referred to gender clinics. Over a 10-year period, Tavistock saw an increase of more than 3,000%, and the vast majority were girls seeking gender treatment. In Canada, the numbers have also shot up. Estimates suggest they've gone from under 25 referrals to over 1,000 in just over a decade. 82% of them are girls. The most interesting important thing is no one knows why that is. And it hasn't been interrogated. You think if you are a health service and you notice this phenomenon, you say, hey, that's interesting. Why is that? Like her friend Kira Bell, Sinead Watson was one of those young women whose struggle led her to transition. Only she did it in her 20s. She too came to regret it and detransitioned. When I was about 14 is when I started physically developing into a young woman, but I very much still had the mind of a little girl. But the adults around me started reacting differently to me. One adult in particular, a 50-year-old man who was her boss at a Glasgow cafe in Scotland. He would call me into the staff room and ask for cuddles. There was one time where the dishwasher broke, so we were washing everything in the sinks and he came up behind me and ground his crotch into the back of me and said, can you feel that? Talk to me about your, your mental health at the time. I've kind of self-soothed with alcohol since my teens. You know, I was 21, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating, and this was around about the time that more unwanted sexual instances happened. So I went from thinking, you know, I'm quite uncomfortable as a woman, to thinking, I hate this, and actually I want to be a man and that's when I turned to the internet. Cutting off contact with family and friends, Sinead grew resentful of her body and consumed by YouTube videos and blogs. The 
other trans men would share their stories and they would say, before testosterone, this is how I felt about my body, this is how I felt being a woman, and I was like, that's exactly how I feel. And they would say, you know, and then I took testosterone and all of my problems went away, the depression went away, the dysphoria went away, and I thought, okay, I now know that the name for what I have is gender dysphoria and the treatment is transition. As an adult, Sinead was allowed to refer herself to a gender clinic. Around that time, her mental health spiraled. There was a suicide attempt and time in a psychiatric ward. Before, she says, she was rushed into hormones after only a few hours with a specialist. How much time did you spend face to face with a consultant before taking testosterone? About three hours. The conversation wasn't really anything of substance, so he asked about my psychiatric stay, and I said, um, I've just been very depressed because of my gender dysphoria. That was the end of that discussion. At 24, Sinead began her transition to Sean. Her mother and sister tried to be supportive, but deep down, there was heartbreak. It wasn't the same person, and I grieved for my wee sister. Because it was like one day we had Sinead and then the next day it was Sean and it was two completely different people. You felt you lost your sister? Yeah, oh yeah. I'd, I cried, I cried a lot when I was, I'd been speaking to Sean and it wasn't my sister anymore. The reality came that Sinead was gone, um, was there, and that we wouldn't see her again. Describe Sean, who was he? He was arrogant and argumentative and Honestly, it was a completely different person that, that emerged for, for this transition. Sinead also saw a different person, but in Sean, she saw someone with power who could keep her safe. Sean would not put up with any of that stuff. So it was the idealised male version of myself that, you know, was brave and would stand up for himself and wouldn't let anyone walk all over them. I was trying to escape being Sinead by pretending to be Sean. Coming up. I don't think the children should be allowed to transition. A choice that brings a life-changing commitment. I think that each young person needs to be assessed. When W5 continues. For most of his childhood, Kian Olszewski played hockey. That's him on the girls' team, when Kian was known as Caitlin, competing in tournaments across North America. And I was in for best shooter and for fastest skater, so that was like a really memorable one. When Kian came out as transgender, he says the teasing and bullying became so unbearable he needed to quit hockey. But his disappointment was overshadowed by the sheer joy of physically transitioning from female to male. At 15, he was injecting himself with testosterone. At 17, underwent top surgery and a year later, gave up his fertility by having a hysterectomy. How did Kian at age 17 know what he's going to want at age 30, 35, or age 40? Like, first of all, I was never in my mind for a second thought that I was gonna want to, you know, become a mother or anything like that. Like I. You know, I want to be a father and all this. So um, you always saw yourself as a father, not yes, a mother. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and for me, like, I know it means that I can't have my own biological children, but there's a lot of other ways to have kids. At every step of the way, Kian says he's felt more and more like who he should have been from the start. For Sinead Watson, the changes are also irreversible, except her scars are a constant reminder that the high she felt after her top surgery faded within months. You don't grow boobs back. <laughs> you know, if you get those cut off, they're, they're gone. For the testosterone, so the first thing that went was my voice. Like I developed my Adam's apple. You grow a beard. With time, your hair will start to thin or fall out. Sinead felt increasingly depressed and a sense of regret crept in. Because you thought that taking the testosterone would make it go away, and it didn't. You thought the double mastectomy would make it go away, and it didn't. What if transition just wasn't what you were supposed to do? Sinead stopped taking testosterone and detransitioned back to female. I felt a sense of relief for her. 
Um, I was ecstatic. <laughs> I was so happy. Yeah, because you call me, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get my sister back. <laughs> yeah. I, w I was just relieved um, that maybe this dark time for the family as a whole, an extended family as well, um, that she finally has peace. Psychiatrist Dr David Bell was on the Council of Governors at Tavistock, which runs England's only gender identity clinic for children. He believes there is a growing number of people detransitioning who were not adequately assessed in the first place. You talk about how dangerous this approach is, but if that's the case, why aren't we seeing more detransitioners? The Tavistock say there's a very low number of people who regret it. They have no evidence for that. They base their figures on people who come back to the Tavistock and say they regret it, but the people who I've talked to would never go near the Tavistock because they feel so let down. And because they haven't followed up, they've got no figures. Trans people make up only 1% of the population, yet this has been called the most politicized field of medicine. Opinion is divided both on the treatment and the statistics. At McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario, there is an 18-month waiting list. Their gender clinic was founded by Dr. Natasha Johnson. She's adamant. Detransitioning is not only rare, but focusing on it overshadows what she says is a high success rate. In Canada, there is data uh, about transition. Um, so there is a study of about 500 uh, people who have gone through transition, which include hormones, uh, blockers, or surgery, um, and 96% uh, report that they are satisfied. So a lot of people might be watching and will be thinking, hang on a second. A 13, 14, 15-year-old is not old enough to drive. They need parental consent to go on a school trip I think to assume that in general, 13 year olds have no knowledge of, of the future or of the consequences of decisions, I think would be an overstatement. I think that each young person needs to be assessed. It would be also important to share stories of the thousands of people who um, are satisfied with transition uh, and report that the interventions were life-saving. But Dr. Bell believes life or death conversations are overstated. He says gender dysphoric children often have other issues like depression, autism, or a history of trauma, and that it's wrong to only connect suicidal ideation to their gender dysphoria. He thinks families are being misled when they're told the choice is between transition or suicide. The parents being told such things as, do you want a live son or a dead daughter? It's not true. There isn't the evidence to support that suicidality. In fact... Many would disagree with you. Well, there isn't. There really is not that evidence. Part of my assessment is to ask about suicidality. The vast increased numbers of trans and gender diverse youth who reported having been suicidal or reported self-harm very consistent with the literature. So, you know, roughly 60% of these youth, which is uh, a, a, a huge increase compared to other youth. Dr. Bell has a hard time believing some of the data because as he sees it, it's driven by trans activism. A very powerful ideological movement, if you like, the trans lobby, who have been successful very, very successful in a very short space of time in influencing government departments, influencing education, influencing the health services. In fact, some of the Canadian experts we spoke to believe children are being rushed into treatment. They refuse to say so on camera for fear of being called transphobic. I do not think the tra term transphobia is overused. I think it is a real issue. In fact, that may be one of the most difficult parts of the conversation is to understand how people have been mistreated by healthcare providers or other trusted uh, professionals. And healthcare providers in England now have the last word. 
In another legal twist, in September 2021, the Court of Appeal overturned the initial ruling in the Tavistock case, saying it's up to doctors to determine if a child is mature enough to take puberty blockers. In a written statement to W5, Tavistock said, each young person is different and we have no expectation of any given outcome, adding, the majority of young people who are seen by our office do not access puberty blockers or any other physical intervention. Sinead Watson is now a lifeline for other detransitioners who, for the most part, she says, have not told their gender clinics they regret their transition. I don't think that children should be allowed to transition. They're like a sponge. They haven't finished developing yet. You know, I speak to a lot of detransitioners privately. The vast majority of them, you can't find them online. They see the abuse and hostility directed at people like Sinead and want nothing to do with it. The regular ones is transphobe. Um, I get that quite a lot. Um, I get told that I was never really trans, that I was a liar, that I was a fake. Um, I get told that I have the blood of trans suicide on my hands. This stuff here? Yeah. No, that's gold. The debate on treatment for gender dysphoric children can be vitriolic, and it can be hard to know who to trust. For the Olszewski family in Canada, there was never any doubt. I look at him in those pictures and I see Kian. Kian, yeah. You don't see Caitlin. I don't see know. Caitlin. Yeah. Kind of wish. He was born with the right body. Kian, you're being able to transition at a young age. Well, he will have a very happy, uh, you know, productive life. This is something that goes so far back to like as far as I can remember, but I wasn't being my full self. I wasn't at my full potential. The legal battle over the medical treatment of children with gender dysphoria isn't over in the UK. Kira Bell plans to seek permission to appeal the latest verdict. That means her case could go all the way to England's Supreme Court.